that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. Our psalm today is Psalm 51. We will read responsively by whole verse. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, and in your great compassion blot out my offenses. Wash me, and cleanse me from my sins. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you. And so you are justified when you speak and upright your judgment. But for behold, you look for the truth for the truth depth in me. You will make me understand wisdom and secrecy. Make me hear of joy and gladness, that the body you have broken may rejoice. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Give me the joy of your saving help again and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. A reading from the prophet Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, 
when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. I invite us to stand now and turn in our hymnals to hymn number 439. Let's join in singing, What Wondrous Love Is This? Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. 
I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. There's a seminary, I think it's in Chicago, where the pulpit actually has a, a plaque that's on the pulpit, and uh, it's only there for the preacher to read. And what it says on that little plaque is, we wish to see Jesus. And it's a reminder to whoever is preaching on that day from that particular place. It is a reminder that the preacher is called to in some way express or to show, give expression to the person of Jesus. And so that's the challenge for any preacher, is to imagine how they are to be able to offer some glimpse of Christ in everything that they preach, some glimpse of the gospel light in everything that they offer on a given day, no matter what the, the theme may be for the lessons on that day. I think about that today, and I'm sure that uh, in the gospel lesson there was a thought that uh, the people of that period and time had heard a message about the, the ministry of Jesus. And they, they seemed to connect with something that was beyond any other teaching that they'd ever heard before. They were longing to be in the presence of Jesus, the Christ. And even these Greeks were longing to be in the near presence of Christ. It's understood in the Greek tradition of the time that there was a sense of being able to gather knowledge and wisdom from a variety of cultures and to bring it into their culture, to draw from it and to find the best that it has to offer. And so you might remember there being a place uh, in, uh, in some of the Greco-Roman world where there were many statues of many different expressions of gods. And in those expressions, there is also a statue to the, the, the statue to an unknown God. And it was in that place uh, that Peter one day expresses, you see this statue to the unknown God? That's the God that we worship. That's the one beyond the many. That's the one who encapsulates everything that you have come to know about God as an expression of God and is now an offering, a kaleidoscope of images that's offered for you to understand more and more about the one God, the one beyond the many. Jesus is, is speaking about the one beyond the many when he begins to open up for the, for the disciples you notice that he doesn't really respond to that request. Remember the Greeks go to, to Philip first, and they say, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And that's intriguing to Philip. And so he goes to Andrew with these Greeks and says, Look, they want to see Jesus. And then Philip and Andrew go with those Greeks to Jesus, and they tell him, These gentlemen want to see you. And when Jesus responds, he responds in a different way, doesn't he? He doesn't really respond to the request that these gentlemen want to see Jesus. He responds to speak about the present time. Here we are in this season of life in my ministry. This time has come where suddenly there is going to be an unfolding of the whole meaning of everything that I've been here to offer. An unfolding of what it means to be the Christ. Jesus of Nazareth becoming known now as Jesus the Christ. 
as that unfolding begins to take shape. Jesus is, is telling those apostles about this ministry that he has. And he's telling them more and more about what is going to happen. And he, remember, he speaks about that serpent that's going to be lifted up, that, uh, that Moses referred to. And just as Moses spoke of the servant being lifted up, Jesus speaks about himself being lifted up to glorify God on that day. Lifted up to glorify God. Now, there's one interpretation of that, that he's talking specifically about him being lifted up on the cross as a form of persecution and ultimately death. That he's speaking about his broken body being an outpouring of perfect love, of incredible love. That his broken body is now an expression of him being held up above all of God's beloved children as a sign and symbol of emptying himself for the sake of others, for the sake of God's creation, including all of God's creatures. And that means us, as well as all of the other creatures we know out in nature. The other way to think about being lifted up is Jesus is also lifted up from the grave. On the day of his resurrection, he's, he's, he discovers or he lives out the fact that death has no power over him. And so he's lifted up from the grave and finds himself in the near presence of God. But he's lifted up from the grave and then finds himself right back there amongst his disciples as an expression of resurrection and life, as an expression of God never leaving us comfortless, but always, always being there to strengthen us, even in the midst of of the sudden tragedy of death that comes upon Christ and someday comes upon us. All of us might say that we would do anything to preserve our life, but there is also that reality that there's no way that we can preserve our life forever, no matter how much we try. There's also the sense that preserving our life is about gathering things up to, to support us in each and every new day of life. But there is alongside that the sense of offering ourselves and even our things an outpouring of giving to others for God's sake that is held in tandem with what we need to, to live and move and have our being to sustain ourselves but also what the world needs, the people around us need, to sustain the communities where we live. There is, in Jesus' response, a sense that he was going to ultimately live out the whole identity, his whole purpose, the whole meaning of his life. And that offering, that gift, was a gift for everyone, everyone who comes next, from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. And you and I are ex have experienced that in our lives. That's why we still gather on Sunday mornings to hear these stories, to be strengthened for the journey that comes next, and to know and to feel that we are a part of a legacy. Many generations who have experienced God's love through Christ and continue to experience that love through Christ through the many members of the body of Christ in the world today, even in our own community, and the expression of their care and love and compassion and their expression of, of thoughtfulness and hope, their expression of obedience, but also joy that all comes together and brings us together as the many members, the children of God. This fifth Sunday in the season of Lent is one that reminds us that Jesus is on his way toward Jerusalem. You and I know the rest of the story. We know what comes during what we call Holy Week. We know the full expression of Jesus' outpouring of love for God's sake and for our sake. We know that so well that sometimes it may be hard for us to, to think about all of the pieces that go into making this such a vital story in our faith. 
The leading up to Easter is significant. What happens on Good Friday is truly significant. And every breath that we breathe until we get to that place is meaningful and offers us an opportunity for all of the things we talked about in that bidding prayer on Ash Wednesday. That we can read Holy Scripture and feel those stories come alive in our hearts. That we can pray without ceasing and know our need of something beyond ourselves to guide us into our community life, our relationships, and the love and care that we have for one another. And to also do the good works that God calls us to do, to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbor as ourself, and serving the purposes of God wherever they may be found around us. Lent offers that beautiful opportunity, but it also reminds us of the one who modeled for us all of those things, Jesus of Nazareth, who becomes Jesus the Christ as this story continues to unfold. We might wonder how it is that we are supposed to glorify God in all of this, and there is a hymn that reminds us of uh, our friend uh, Patrick of Ireland. It's found in the hymnal. It's hymn number 370. If you look on the last page of that hymn, you'll see that the tune, that the words actually in the tune are words that are offered from Patrick of Ireland. In fact, the music is often called St. Patrick's Breastplate. It is an Irish melody that was adapted particularly for this hymn in the 19th century. Here's that refrain. I bind unto myself today the strong name of the Trinity by invocation of the same, the three in one and one in three. And I'm skipping down to verse five. I bind unto myself today the power of God to hold and lead, his eye to watch, his might to stay, his ear to hearken to my need. The wisdom of my God to teach, his hand to guide, his shield to ward, the word of God to give me speech, his heavenly host to be my guard. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me. Patrick of Ireland discovered very well how to glorify God in all of his ministry. And we remember him and give thanks for his life and ministry as we remember and give thanks for the opportunities that God gives us to glorify God through Christ each and every day of our lives. Amen. I invite you now to stand and join me as we affirm our faith using the Nicene Creed, which begins on page 5 in your worship bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. Christ. Pontius Pilate. <laughs> he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. 
We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and revive your glory to, in the world. In the larger church, we pray for the Church of Wells. In our diocese, we give thanks for Habitat of Humanity and Habitat Builders of the West of West Texas. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all nations in ways of justice and peace that we may honor one another and serve in common good. We pay, pay especially for Joe, our president, and the Congress, Greg, our governor and the legislature, Ray, our county judge and the commissioner's court, Tim and Kelly, our mayors and the city councils. Lord, in your mercy. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly and in service of others and to our honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Bless all who live, whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. We pray for those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week, including Sarah Craven, Mike Kovion, John Warren, Julie Clout, Bill Silva, Seth Gamble, Francine, Francis Schmidt, and Lynn Bergman, and also Tommy and Susan Allen. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Give them the courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray especially for those listed in our parish prayer list. Lord, in your mercy. We commend to your mercy all who have died, especially Duane Solis, that, you may, that your will for them may ful be fulfilled and your prayer that you, we may share with you your saints and your eternal kingdom. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, ask us to help us to ask only that which accords with your will. And those good things which we dare not, or in our blindness cannot ask, grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the, the glory, glory of your, of your name. name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Today and also uh, a pleasure to share this uh, worship on this day and uh, just a reminder to you that we do gather around the altar rail for Holy Communion. Uh, you may stand or kneel whichever is your preference. Uh, you're invited to receive the communion wafer which is bread in your hand like so. Hold that in your fingertips. When the chalice of wine comes to you you can dip or intinct your wafer into the wine and then commune yourself in both kinds. And as we do that, uh, we are sharing in the great thanksgiving, the Holy Eucharist. Now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
Our worship continues now with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By whose grace we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray.
Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you.
Now using the prayer that's found at the top of page 11, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Are there birthdays or anniversaries for us to bless this morning? Well, just a reminder that we do have a fellowship, great refreshments, a great time together to, to visit in the parish hall following our worship this morning. I do want to call your attention to the announcements that you'll see on the back of your worship bulletin. Uh, please do notice that there is a fish fry coming up on Friday, this coming Friday, at 6 p.m. And uh, let me just ask that anyone who is going to be able to help with that uh, opportunity and event, uh, if we could meet in the parish hall in a, for just a brief moment, uh, just to touch base and talk about uh, some plans and different things and getting ready for that. So, uh, uh, but that should be a great time to be together and good food. So uh, hopefully we can uh, to enjoy that evening together next Friday. Uh, announcements this, Myra, you have an announcement. Go ahead. As most of you know, I'm very involved with uh, the June Project, which is, was founded by Dr. Dana Mercer in 2004. The whole purpose of the June Project is to uh, help save 
dogs and cats at the at no one's expense except the June project. And a little bit about how it was founded. Um, she was called to a hoarder's house in 2004, and she had to euthanize 19 animals. And there was one animal dog, a Labrador that weighed 19 pounds, came up to her just when she was fixing to euthanize her, wagged her tail, and licked Dana's hand. This is how the June Project got started. Her name was June. She survived, and she passed away about four years ago. But ever since then, the project has gone on and on. And the reason I am telling y'all this is because on Monday the 25th, Pop's Tavern in Lamar is going to have a fundraiser for the June Project because that's, that's how we finance the, the animals. I have forms laid out on the table in front of the nursery. If anyone would like to pre-order uh, plates, which it's a barbecue plate with brisket, sausage, and potato salad, and all the fixings. That pre-order amount is $18. If you buy the ticket, the, you know, and while you're there, it's $20. They also have loaded baked potato for $12 pre-order and $18 at the door. One of the special things about this project is all the money raised goes straight to the June Project. It doesn't go to Horizon Veterinary Clinic. It doesn't go to Dana. It doesn't go back to Pops. It all goes toward the June Project. Um, the June Project has saved over 700 animals in loving forever homes. And one of those animals is mine, Sean, who, uh, as a puppy, he had really bad heart murmur. She took him to the uh, Texas A&M Animal Hospital up there. They did open heart surgery on him, and he's, he's fine. <laughs> um, that alone cost $10,000 to get him well. And I'm so forever grateful for that. So my, my ask of you is if you can, um, find the forms back there. And uh, my phone number is on the bottom of one of them and you can give me a call. And I can uh, take your order over the phone. Uh, we have tickets, I have some tickets with me today. Uh, and if you buy them today, then uh, you know, you get the, the pre-order uh, price. But anyway, I would like to thank very much to, uh, Father Jim for letting me do this because it is very, very close to my heart. Uh, and I remember, oh, we deliver too. We're gonna deliver the food so you don't have to go all the way to Lamar to pick it up. If you want to, you can, but we'll have some at the, uh, at the Horizon Veterinary Clinic and then the others we will all deliver to you and let you know when we're coming. So if you have any questions, you can see me afterwards. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Myra. And Sherry Collins has some information to share with us from the Daughters of the King. I'm sorry, Valerie has, no, oh, Sherry has. Oh. Sherry's gonna to talk to us this morning about uh, information from the Daughters of the King, about the Episcopal Church. This is a continuation today of our talks on the signs and symbols of the church, which were written by Vernetta Sorrells, who came to us from the Lutheran Church many years ago and was very enthusiastic about everything she was discovering. But first, I want to tell you that on next Saturday at 9.30, we will have in the parish hall 
a palm cross making session. Now we make about 200 palm crosses each year. And so if you want to come learn how to do it, we'll be glad to teach you. It's lots of fun. It's sometimes a little difficult at first, but we have people that are really good at it and will help all of us. And if nothing else, you can come and cut palms for us. That would be fine too. Now, what I'm really talking to you about today is some of the linens, mostly, of, that are in use at the altar. And here's what Vernetta says. She starts out with the sanctuary light, which is the red light that you observe over here that is burning. The red light, usually a burning candle, indicates the presence of reserved sacrament. Reserved sacrament is the consecrated or blessed wafers and wine, which are kept within the tabernacle or ombre. Now, an ombre is a freestanding tabernacle, and that's what we have now. What we used to have in the old church was a built-in tabernacle, but it serves the same purpose. Uh, reserved sacrament is used to take communion to the sick or shut-ins, and if there's no time to consecrate more, if the priest should run out of consecrated uh, elements during a communion service, he can go in there and take out some that is in reserve and use it. So we almost always have reserved sacrament, except on Good Friday, because on Monday, Thursday, the night before, we remove and either consume or pour down the sink in the sacristy. And this room in here is the sacristy. We have a special drain which goes directly to the ground and in which we sometimes pour reserved sacrament or uh, leftover sacraments because we have to treat these special. And the reason we treat them special is because we believe in the real presence of Christ in the consecrated elements, that is, the bread and wine. We treat the consecrated elements with special care. Episcopalians say that the real presence is a mystery, and we genuflect, bend the knee to the floor to recognize Christ in reserve sacrament. Now, a lot of us are old, including myself, and we can't bend that well, so you have to just do the best you can on that one. But anyway, uh, we are reserving, we are recognizing the presence of Christ in the reserved sacrament when we do that. And this may be done by adding the sign of the cross in formal recognition when entering or leaving pews. Now, Vernetta goes on to talk about votive candles. When you enter an Episcopal church, you might see a small side altar over here with rows of votive candles. The word votive comes from the Latin votive, meaning vow. These are candles which aren't blessed and usually are, made, are not made of beeswax, but when they are lighted, they symbolize our prayers, vows of prayer, or simple, simply honoring God or one of his saints. They are lit by people outside of the Mass before or after or during simple visits to the church, usually for a specific intention. It's a spiritual thing to say to someone that you will light a candle for them, meaning that you will pray for them and ritually symbolize those prayers by the lighting of a votive. The candles generally last about 10 hours and burn continuously until they burn out. It's not uncommon, too, to find these intentions written out and placed near the candles. Well, we don't do that because it's too dangerous. It could set a fire. But the other thing that we do is we light candles out of gratitude to God for answered prayers. We light the candle while praying for our intention or offering our thanks, and then we leave the flame burning as signs of our prayers. And she says you might see a little coin box or basket nearby at some locations. 
but I don't think she knew that there is a slot in the front of the votive rack in which you can put a coin or a bill to help pay for the candles if you wish. But if you're poor and you can't do that, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Uh, it is right, otherwise, to drop some coins in the uh, box in the uh, votive rack. Now, you may have noticed that Latin is the language of the church, just as Italian is a, the language of music and French is the language of cooking. And um, we don't exactly know how um, Latin was actually pronounced, but we do have something called uh, church Latin, which is kind of a made up kind of Latin that the church uses. Because I don't think anybody was around during a time when Latin was actually spoken and there aren't too many pronunciation guides. Anyway, Vernetta goes on, and what I brought here is some sacramental linens to show you. The Altar Guild is a group of people that are designated to prepare for all services and clean up after all services. We always take care of the altar first and foremost. We do not walk out and leave it in a mess. We have to take care of it and we have to dispose or put into reserve the consecrated elements. So we have a special job there to do that. And it's a calling because it is tedious, it is time consuming, and there is a lot of it to do. So it's, it's an ongoing thing. Anyway, Vernetta says first, the altar fair linen cloth is the most used cloth for the altar. It's a hand hem cloth of fine linen which covers the top of the altar and hangs down at each end. It's embroidered only in white with a cross at each corner and one in the center, representing the five wounds of Christ in his hands, his feet, and his side. So this is the fair linen here, which you see on the altar and the knot where it is. Come up some time and look at it and you'll see the five crosses, one on each corner and the big one in the center. And this is but we do have some that are heavily embroidered. And unofficially, this represents the winding cloth that was in Christ, that was around Christ's body in the tomb. Now I'm going to show you something else. This piece of cloth is the only piece of cloth you really need. If you are out doing, setting up a Eucharist outside, for instance, you can take this one piece of cloth and that is sufficient. This is called a corporal. And unofficially, it represents the winding cloth that was around, around Christ's head in the tomb. It is always folded. It has, a, it has a cross in the lower third center and it's embroidered. And I'm sure you've noticed Father Jim folding these up at the end of the service. This is a sacred piece of cloth. You always tend to this first. And when you fold it, it goes in thirds, representing the Holy Trinity. But this is the only piece of cloth you really, really cannot do without. And then we also have what is called a purificator. This again is folded in thirds for the Trinity, always. See, the symbolism continues through everything at all times. You may miss it or not know what it is, but believe me, there is something symbolic about it always. This one has a cross in the center. It's put on top of the chalice to cover the lip of the chalice when the chalice is so-called vested. And it uh, is used to wipe the lip of the chalice always. Now. There's something else here. We have a, what is called a pall. This is plexiglass, and it's covered with pure linen, and it has a cross on it. It supports the veil. This is the veil. The colored veil usually matches the liturgical season, 
and it will have an emblem of some kind on it. Again, this is the Trinity emblem on this piece. What we have on the altar right now is wool. This is wool. Different fabrics are used. Sometimes we have silk. Sometimes we have wool or other fabrics. All of these things are very expensive. And the altar guild is charged with taking care of these. We see that they're clean, they're pressed, they're washed, whatever needs doing. And that is a sacred responsibility, but it's one that we're really privileged to have, and we know it. <laughs> but I think you really have a guilt because it can be tedious at times, and it can be demanding at times, and the busiest that we are the whole year is during Holy Week, which is coming up next week. So if any of you want to come and observe what goes on, what we do, please come, especially on Monday, Thursday, when we will be stripping the altar and you will see how that is done if you have never seen that before. Also, we will be discarding the reserve sacrament on that night. Now, in some churches, they put it in reserve at a separate altar, and that can be done, but it's totally at the discretion of the priest. You may think that we do what we want. We do not. We follow what the priest wants, always. And we have altar guild manuals that help tell us what to do in case there's any questions. We can still make mistakes, but we try real hard not to. Now, this is called a verse. This goes on top of your chalice. You've seen this on the altar. What it has in it is, guess what? More purificators in case somebody needs them. And sometimes we do. They are always handy. And let's see. I haven't told you about the lavabo towel. This is a towel that you will notice that the lay reader puts on usually the left arm and will take the bowl in the hand and uh, when they come over to do the ablutions with the priest and pour the water over the little bowl and over the hands, then they offer this to the priest. And this is just another example of church linens. All of these things are very well, out, well uh, thought out. And they have their origins back in the period when the Jews were wandering in the desert. If you look in Genesis, in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy uh, Numbers, Leviticus, you will see that God gave very specific instructions as exactly how to set up the altar, exactly what colors to use, exactly everything. It's no accident that we have this information. A lot of people don't know that what we do arises out of that period of history. So I thought you might especially like to look that up a little bit and see what God asked the Jews to do while they were wandering in the desert. Another thing that Vernetta talked about is the funeral pall. Okay, in the Episcopal Church, we must have a pall on a closed casket. Caskets are not open in the church during a funeral or even before. They are brought in sealed and a pall, which is very large, is put onto the casket. It has a long gold cross on it. And now it is white. Since the prayer book changed in 1979, before then we used a purple pall. Now we use white for joy. All of these things mean something. It's not an accident. And uh, the altar guild helps put the pall on the casket as it comes in the door. As it goes out, we remove the pall. And the same thing is true with your uh, pall that goes on your cremains. There's a small pall with a cross on it that's square that fits over cremains. This is done for one reason. It's done because all funerals should be alike for the rich are the poor. 
and that's the reason why this is done and it is mandated by the national church so if you have any question that's why that is done and um, another thing let's see I, we talked about the veil uh, yeah the veil is usually the same fabric as the superfrontal here which is the colored portion now that can vary with the season right now purple represents mourning and it also represents um, a sense of penitence green is the all-purpose color for the whole of the rest of the year after easter practically after the 50 days of easter are over but you will also see red for martyrdom sometimes for the holy spirit you will see in some churches especially up north you will see blue during advent <clears throat> and um, there are other colors that have crept in the colors are mandated in our mother church the church of england they are not mandated in the united states and you will see colors like gold creeping in or ox blood or some other color on occasion so don't be surprised if you see something that's not quite what you're used to especially in a different part of the country okay i'm almost done have a little just a little bit more to say the paraments are the hangings and the liturgical colors used on the altar pulpit and lectern a pen antipinium is latin meaning to hang before it's a silk or other finely embroidered cloth hung on the front of the altar pulpit and lectern it may also be called a frontal it may be white green red purple or black and um, I think that about covers the linens. Now, there is one more talk in this series, and we will be giving that after uh, Easter because it is about the sacred vessels that we work with, and it's very important, and I think, hope you'll find it interesting. But since next week is uh, Holy Week and Palm Sunday, we'll have enough to do and I hope you'll come and help us make palm crosses. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. <clears throat> Look with compassion, O Lord, upon this your people, that rightly observing this holy season, they may learn to know you more fully and to serve you with a more perfect will. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we go down to fellowship and back out into the world, we'll join now in singing hymn number 473, and we'll sing the first and last hymn, uh, verses of Lift High the Cross.
Be glad, all you whose sin is put away. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.